Good afternoon, and welcome to another exciting hour of Unlock the Door Radio. This is your host, Michael Cross, and today we have a very special guest, uh, Sean Stone, actor, director, social activist, and the host of the program Buzzsaw. And without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Sean, let him tell you a little bit about himself, and then we're going to deal with issues relating to uh, the surveillance state and many of the issues facing us, uh, those of us who are concerned with which direction the country is going and what's happening to the Bill of Rights. Uh, again, thank you very much for coming on today, Sean. Absolutely, man. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So let for those in the audience that don't know who you are, could you kind of fill them in a little bit more than I did there? Yeah, well – it's hard to introduce yourself, but um, you know, I, I, you know, I grew up in the film world. Uh, my father's Oliver Stone, so I was, you know, grew up around the film set since a kid and acted in some of his films, like uh, JFK. I played uh, Kevin Costner's son and uh, young Jim Morrison in The Doors, and uh, Mallory Knox's little brother in Natural Point Killers, and so I, you know, I grew up around uh, the, my father's work, seeing him, you know, seeing him as a writer and filmmaker. And ended up going to work with him in Alexander. I shot the behind the scenes and uh, spent pretty much every day on set with him, uh, documenting his his journey and how you know how a director works and operates. And did the, um, the three behind the scenes featurettes as well as a feature length documentary on uh, that that process. And then uh, graduated from uh, from Princeton studying history. Um, thereafter, I pursued filmmaking uh, full-time, uh, working uh, on W as an editor, as well as doing the behind-the-scenes featurettes on that, as well as a, a little featurette on Nixon for the re-release of the DVD. Uh, so that took me more into the political uh, spectrum when I was doing those featurettes were, were more political in nature, uh, discussing the abuses of power, for example, of the Nixon administration and the, the, the George Bush, uh, uh, George W. Bush administration. Um, and then thereafter, I directed. I worked on my first uh, uh, feature film, which I directed called Greystone Park, which is a horror film set in a haunted mental hospital based on the experiences that I had with my co-writer and co-actor, uh, Alexander Wraith. He and I used to go break into uh, this place called Greystone, which is a very famous abandoned mental hospital in New Jersey. And uh, once we explored inside there, we found it was pretty haunted and creepy. So based on our experiences, we wrote a script and turn it into a film. And uh, that's now out on Netflix and, uh, you know, uh, Amazon, DVD, all that kind of stuff, Blockbuster. So that was, uh, you know, I've, I've kind of gone from, you know, from political and, and historical to paranormal in my work. Uh, ended up joining Conspiracy Theory with Jesse Ventura in 2012. Uh, as a result of that, uh, you could say that sort of uh, dichotomy, you know, being able to, uh, discuss the historical roots of things like the Illuminati and um, have, you know, have intellectual discussions at the same time, you know, draw upon my experiences with the paranormal. Do you think it helps you a little bit when it comes to, you know, we often hear in the alternative media um, references made to the ruling elite and to organizations, you know, you hear terms like Illuminati and so forth. Uh, you grew up in an a very influential area. You rubbed elbows, uh, and probably still do, with very influential people. Um, do you have any insights that maybe might be unique in regards to uh, how things are really run in the United States? I mean, we're taught in in, in uh, public school from you know that people who have a civic duty they run for office they. They um, are giving of themselves unselfishly, and then you have two parties that compete with each other, and depending on who has a message that people want to hear, you elect this person to represent you, and then they follow the Constitution. Um, right. is, in your experiences, is that uh, too simplistic or, or just downright not true? Right. Um, well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't claim to have any kind of um, phenomenal insights when it comes to the occult nature of power. Um, I never saw. You know, I never saw 
conspiracies being conducted, you know, in back rooms or, or um, let's say the more, what, what is called occult nature of power, which is hidden, you know, the hidden nature, the hidden roots and origins of power. But one thing I think that you become aware of in, in, in as you said, rubbing elbows or, you know, observing and being around people of uh, great influence and, uh, and power, whether it be in ent entertainment or politics or wealth, is the tremendous amount of ego. Um, you know, frankly, you're dealing with people with, with huge egos that are being, you know, constantly uh, catered to. And in that environment, it's, you know, unless you're around people with, you know, huge egos, it's difficult to quite grasp the amount of um, the levels of evil that people will go to to maintain their, their power. Let's put it like that. Um, the idea of the civic serv the, civ the civic duty of service, the idea of Jimmy, you know, the Jimmy Smith character, you know, Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Um, there are, I'm sure there are plenty of characters like that, but I just, I think that we, that especially in the last, um, let's say 40 years, you know, since the Vietnam war, uh, America has become increasingly, uh, money oriented, you know, the, a, a monetary, a monetary empire, essentially a money empire. Once they went off the gold standard, especially, um, and essentially America went bankrupt from that point forward. Uh, we've been operating within, with this, with this worship of, of Mammon. And as a result, you know, those people in positions of power are, you know, perhaps, I mean, I'm not saying historically more than, than ever before. I'm sure, you know, throughout time, all the empires have had these cults of, of, of money worship, but we are essentially in a time period where people are, where greed is just so pervasive and the, uh, the service to the ego is so dominant that when people talk about Satanism and you have to remember Satanism is very much, uh, rooted in egomania, right? That you were willing to do anything to preserve your position of power and, uh, and even, you know, even involving, you know, horrible acts or, or debasing yourself, you know, in prostitution type of situations of prostituting your, your morality, um, for, you know, to maintain your power. And I think that's a very important point that you have to realize when, when discussing the people who are in positions of power that we know of, not even, not even discussing the, the ones who are more, uh, behind the scenes, uh, let's say with their, with, with their control, with their ownership of, uh, property for example, or, you know, ownership of the, of, not ownership, but let's say like control of the, the, the markets, you know, things like controlling gold markets and prices and things like this. There's a lot of manipulation that we've seen more and more being exposed, right? The Libor scandal, for example, the idea of price fixing and, uh, you know, insider setting rates uh, for international uh, uh, money exchanges. But I'm simply saying from the point of view of those who we know are in positions of power, um, the ego is, is very limiting insofar as preventing them from often doing what is best and what is in the highest interest of the public because they, they're trying to cling to their own, uh, their own position. Would you say that many of the leaders today would fit the uh, category of psychopathic? Well, psychopaths are a fascinating subject. Um, I find, I mean, sociopaths, psychopaths, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say are the same thing, but that, you know, uh, as, as you know, are those personalities that are basically wearing human skin. American Psycho is a great, a book and novel that dem that shows that mentality of someone who's willing to do anything and has no because they have no remorse and they only play at being human right they play at human emotions and yet all life is a game to them i i'm not going to personally comment because i don't know enough um politicians let's say or whatnot um but i'm sure that there you know you, there are plenty of people in, in those kind of positions that would that probably would, would be classified sociopaths mm -hmm. yeah the I, I wonder this. I want to veer away a little bit here. Um, re, the we've had a lot of controversy lately. I mean, um, Obama just recently canceled a meeting with Vladimir Putin over Putin giving asylum to uh, Edward Snowden. Uh, of course, Edward Snowden being the whistleblower, who essentially all he did was really tell people what the alternative press has been telling them for like the last five or ten years that. Everything they say and do electronically is pretty much cataloged and kept. And it would be one thing if that was the only thing that's happening, but it seems that there is a – with with more of an emphasis on almost like an authoritarian mindset of the government. Uh, now, you said about a year ago in an interview that uh, you felt the United States had essentially – 
uh, veered into a state of martial law. And, uh, I, you know, you can what, – what did you mean by that? It was based on the National Defense Authorization Act of 2012 that Obama had just signed into law. And it basically said that the government has – has, it, it was giving them a prerequisite – uh, certain prerequisites, circumstances by which they could um, seize all property, all of our private property, and um, you know that I think that was the that was the thrust of it: private property, um, take full control of you know what is essentially you know public public services and goods, uh, but more more importantly, uh, the idea of also being able to imprison people um, without. Uh, due trial, I think, uh, without habeas corpus or due process. I think that's, that was part of the wording in the NDAA of 2012. Mm -hmm. Now, Jimmy Carter, former president of the United States, uh, he recently stated in a German magazine that America has no functional democracy anymore. Um, now, you've done – you you've done um, documentaries on the the Kennedy Johnson era uh, films during the Nixon era. Um, compared to that era, where are we today when it comes to civil rights and democracy? Well, honestly, I mean, I have a problem with the word democracy. I'm not going to lie. Uh, the United States is was you know was founded as a republic for a reason that. There's always been a suspicion of democracy as far as the, um, you know, the masses uh, having too much influence in a sense, because the republic concept, of course, is that, the, you know, the, ma the majority, the majority votes certain people into powers like into power in legislatures, whether it be in the state or at the national level in Congress and the Senate and whatnot. But then the checks and balances would operate between the statesmen, you know, the idea of the, the congressmen having, I mean, that's why we, to this day, we have the, um, the electoral councils, you know, colleges that select the president. It's not a direct uh, democ democratic basis of counting every vote to say whoever gets the majority wins the presidency, right? There's always been some buffer between the people and ultimate power, which is supposed to lie with the presidency, but, and yet doesn't really, because as we know, the executive branch is not supposed to have this, the, the amount of influence it has it has taken you know for right or wrong since FDR the amount of ex executive orders being issued overriding Congress and whatnot the um, you know the question of uh, judicial you know judicial influence it's always been a question of, of, of checks and balances right between the judiciary the executive and the uh, legislature and so the idea of, of statesmen has always had a tremendous import in in American society that you know it's not just about people going out there and saying, you know, we want this an initiative or we want to vote, you know, this guy out of office. It's like there's always a process. There's a process that you have to respect. Um, so as I said, I'm not a fan of this idea of democracy or, you know, what has become branded as democracy is, uh, if you look at it, oftentimes the, 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 the forebearer of fascism. Or, or socialism, but at the end of the day, it's like it 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 it, it becomes a question of, of uh, PR campaigns. Like, how do you you know how do you rally the masses? Right, Hitler was an expert at this. How do you rally people behind you and get everyone on board to support you as a personality? And uh, whoever has the best publicity wins. Right, right now we're in an era of democracy in the sense of uh, McDonald's and Starbucks and the corporate media and corporate America. Walmart has won out, right? Because the masses have voted with their money, with their feet. You know, the, the, that's the concept of, of, of capitalism right now is about democracy. Whatever product gets, you know, makes the most profit is, is the best. And that's not the, the, the spirit, I would I think, of the founding of America, which is not just about majorities or, you know, cross majorities or whatnot. It's about what is right. And what is the best principle, right? What is the best for the for the for the for the, you know, the long term general welfare of a people, not just for the instant gratification of a people. Right. You know, you talk about the civil rights and stuff. I mean, at the end of the day, in the South, majority, the de democratic voice probably would not have been in favor of civil rights. You know, for uh, equal rights for black people, right? And yet, in the end of the day, 
it was deemed for the benefit of the general welfare that black people be incorporated into society, into education, and you know the the, the desegre desegregation of, of life in that society was deemed for the better interest and the common good above democratic desire. And so democracy is a very dangerous word because it always you know it always basically leads to uh, manipulation. Whoever has access to money to manipulate the masses using you know propaganda, media, uh, these tools, you know PR, and ultimately you know whatever. Appeals to the, the lowest common no denominator, you know, whatever is the most um, crass, exciting, and, and, and gratifying in the moment, oftentimes win for the wins for for the democracy, and yet destroys the society in the long term. Yeah, like, I mean, it sounds like you're quoting almost uh, Edward Bernays, who basically said that most of the taste of the public is created from people that they've never seen. These are people that are highly influential and work behind the scenes to be able to uh, manipulate the public mind. Exactly. And Bernays was uh, one of the first architects of uh, propaganda or public relations, as it became called, because propaganda was a derisive term used more for um, manipulation of uh, in wartime situations. But uh, the public relations became the, the, the gentle version of propaganda. Um, and Bernays, of course, was Sigmund Freud's nephew and utilized a lot of Freud's um, knowledge about how the id, you know, the, the, the primitive desires of, of us, of, of man, function and played upon that or preyed upon it, you could say, to influence uh, people's decisions, for example, in buying cigarettes, you know, tying cigarettes into sexuality. Mm -hmm. Sex sells was the old media term, and now people are saying fear sells. Fear sells more than sex right now. So I don't know. You both. Well, I think, I think all of these things come together, and that it is the instincts of survival. And people have used psychology in order to, in order to learn how to pull at those strings and and get what they want. I mean, right now, I mean, there you can look at opinion polls. There are people who, I don't know if they're the majority, but they're a significant minority that say they're perfectly okay with the government knowing. You know the content of their phone calls, their emails, uh, the surveillance state. Uh, they would go further because right. they're so scared of of people who, in many time, in many cases, the U.S. government has actually created and supported. I mean, it, it there's a certain irony to that. Now, the thing is, if we use the term democracy, though, I mean, in its broadest sense. Uh, at least we did have the checks and balances of the Bill of Rights that were thrown in. So the idea being that people cannot just run over or the government cannot just run over rights. Where, where, where are you seeing the Bill of Rights now as opposed to just maybe 10 years ago? And what seems to be the trend right now? I mean in particular the, the First Amendment, the uh, Fourth Amendment, and so forth. Um. Well, I mean, we, I think we're pretty clear that they're not, they're not, uh, you know, they're not there. They're gone. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're, that's it. You know, they're gone. Um, I don't think there's much debate on that question. Uh, the real, the real question is where are we going? If, if we're throwing out the Bill of Rights, we're throwing out the, the premise of our constitution, um, What's you know what's the next incarnation of this republic? If we're going away from that, yeah, I mean it sounds like something from a dystopian movie essentially. I mean, if you got a situation where I, I was, I think um, I've seen two conflicting uh, reports that by 2020 uh, there's been one prediction there will be 10,000 drones in the sky. And another that it'd be thirty thousand. I've heard the thirty thousand more, but even if we go by twenty thousand, that's four hundred aerial drones per state of the United States. I mean, is there going to be such a thing as privacy by twenty twenty? Mm -hmm. um, well, obviously, I think the, the point is that we're moving into a weird uh, virtual reality. Anyway, you know, it's it's being it's. It's part of the experience, you know. How do you say we're we're being led into the experience economy? The idea of you know what the life. How do you say the experience that we can 
the experience is more important than the morality of it, than the, um, than the, the ultimate purpose. You know, it's just what does the experience feel like? And if it feels good to be in a virtual reality, then fantastic. You know, then you're, then you're riding, you're riding into this, um, this altered, this altered state. I mean, maybe that's really where we are heading. I wonder, you know, because it's interesting how the, you know, if you think about the hallucinogens, when they were very pop, you know, became a big phenomenon in the late '60s, early '70s, right? Acid and whatnot. The idea of hallucination. Um, that was, you know, one of the centers of of the, uh, you know, like the free drug clinics and whatnot was San Francisco. You know. Yeah, Haight Ashbury and so forth. Ashbury, and then you think about, well, Silicon Valley crops up right there, next door, and that's almost the uh, the technological manifestation of a different way of seeing reality, right? So as we go deeper into this virtual existence, I think the cybernetic age is upon us. You know, I do believe that there will be some human cyborg nexus that, that is touched upon in the century that we create. And maybe it's a, maybe, you know, maybe there's a positive to it. Maybe the internet will be a, a truly, how do you say, the internet will be a, a, a predecessor to when man connects to other humans directly, you know, so that I can, I can feel your sensations. I can feel your experiences and you can feel, feel mine, you know, um, that is what's coming. In the next yeah, I think, I, I think you're probably right. I, a couple of weeks ago, I interviewed, um, Natasha Vitamore, who, um, is part of that whole Russia 2045 and, you know, transhumanist movement. And, she was saying the same thing. Of course, she was saying it's going to be sooner than the end of this century. It's more like, you know, the next 20, 30 years, we're going to be seeing a, a huge change in the way we relate to machinery and experience. And the whole concept of downloading will be totally different than what we think of as today. But do you think that, well, if, if, we, if we look at the American economy today, though, I mean, are could this in some way um, either fuse into this or maybe hinder it? I don't know because I, I read a report recently that 80 percent of Americans are either dangerously close to poverty or are receiving some sort of government aid like food stamps or something like that. People just being like a paycheck away from homelessness um, and it's really affecting the middle class a lot. But you don't see this in the media so much. Um, do you have any insight as why the the media is sort of? I know I've hit you with two different questions there, but it just seems the economy is not as good as what we would be presented in on the big networks. And what are your what are your thoughts on that? I mean, are we heading to, you know, maybe being poor but connected to our computers so we won't care? Well, we, maybe we'll become the computers. <laughs> I mean, the point is, we don't know where the technology is taking us. You see what I'm saying? Like, when, as, we, as we, become, we can become avatars in a new um, virtual reality more and more. You know, you see these Google glasses that people are wearing, right? Mm -hmm. When it, you know, that's just, it's just the next evolution. So the next, each evolution, who knows where, you know, where we're taking it. Because at the end of the day, it's about consciousness, right? Where is human consciousness going? Um, I think that as far as talking about in terms of where we are now is a tremendous psychological schizophrenia you see people are going through schizophrenia and it's expressing itself in clashes of civilization of cultures of religions because people are confused they don't know you know it, maybe it is the apocalypse maybe it is an end time or not uh, an apocalypse meaning an unveiling right mm -hmm. uh, an unveiling of uh, of truth you know as we as we have to deal with grapple with who we are as, as beings and, and what you know what we're doing as humans on this planet because we, now we have access to so much information and knowledge unlike ever before in human history it was only that this kind of information was only accessible to the to the shamans to the mystics to the people who, who could take their minds into different states and, and draw upon the you want to call it the ether but the ether or the, or the akashic records or uh, just you know a different vision of reality right mm -hmm. Um, now it's more and more accessible to people. It's accessible to people through through instant imaging and media and um, and and 
the visions that we call films or music videos or whatnot, TV. So all this information is affecting is affecting our human consciousness. And and it, it varies, you know, it, it creates this schizophrenia, it creates this imbalance, it creates this polarization of where do we go next? You know, people don't don't really know. Um, they're it, I think it first express itself through some kind of catastrophe, whether it be, you know, global uh, what's called global warming, but really it's global weather phenomenon, you know, extremes, mm-hmm. climate change, um, shifting of, perhaps shifting of magnetic poles, um, more, okay, I mean, we're seeing it already in the North, the, the North Pole, I believe, you know, the ice is melting and whatnot. We're going to see physical disasters manifesting as part of this, this nexus of mind, of human mind, spirit, and, and, and universal you know energies there, there there's there's an effect you know we humans are feeling the earth we're you know we're in touch with the stars we're getting we're affected by cosmic radiation at all at all times and so whatever you know whatever we're going through as a planet as a human species i think it's going to be more and more chaotic and i think that's why the um the mental states of people are kind of breaking down and add has become so prevalent and uh you know the the, the psyches are, are very tenuous at this moment uh there's a lot of confusion here it's very do you see do you see people breaking off into two different directions though? I mean, there's there's still a huge percentage of the people of the Western world that are relying on, uh, I mean, you could almost call it corporate slash state media, and that would be the big networks um, in the United States, and and I would argue also those networks extend into Europe because the Europeans pick up on the same news agencies, and so most of the the news is the same news. It's just written slightly differently. And then you're going to see uh, there's a lot of activity going on in the alternative media in which people are questioning. And I think that's the number one thing about alternative media is people are questioning. Do you think that this schism is going to occur in which there's going to be an extremely well-informed, um, almost esoteric section of the population and then a very large section of the population that just is just going nowhere maybe (laughs) (laughs) Uh, it kind of feels that way doesn't it look i mean look if you look at the what the elite have talked about and maybe they knew this was coming you know because they they foresaw it you could say they've always talked about how the planet's population has to be reduced and it's part of the great harvest right the christian harvest or the you know the apocalypse or um simply you know the, the environmentalist agenda of depopulation right half the planet has to die or you know at least at least half the planet maybe up to two-thirds have to have to be wiped out according to um you know a lot of the elite uh the elites let's say you know the, who who are in positions of power and who do create the environment like the environmentalist network even prince philip you know talked about having wanting to come back as a um as a virus to be able to uh to kill the human race and uh, bertrand russell talking about you know the, the idea of a black death to check the population so who knows i mean maybe they're right maybe there is something coming that is going to devastate the human population and bring us down below three million i'm not saying that's what i, I think i want to happen i'm saying that's what a lot of people in the you know in the higher realms of power you know have have said is necessary i don't believe that i don't think that the earth has a carrying capacity of two billion or three billion that's an old um venetian idea that was uh, adopted by uh malthus you know thomas malthus adopted that from the venetians based on carrying you know the carrying capacity idea that the humans have to live off the earth and there's only so much land space so the population can't reach above you know a billion or something but I think that's all nonsense. The point is that human evolution um, is ultimately bound for the stars. I think that we as humans have to go to space. We have to keep evolving our, our you know, our, our place in the universe because we have an integral point, in, integral place here. You know, humans have something very unique to offer because we're, as this, the mystics talked about, you know, we're part angel or part animal, and we kind of we, uh, we we stand in between these these spheres. You know, between our desire, our animal needs of feeding and lusting and you know procreation and uh and our and our consciousness which is so vast and, and curious constantly wanting to know more so we're at that point where we have to decide are we going to carry off into space are we going to 
carry our evolution of our civilization forward or are we going to allow ourselves to kill ourselves on this planet on this rock do you think the mainstream media is is retarding that growth in human well, consciousness i don't know what the mainstream media is doing there there's a lot of fear mongering that goes on through the mainstream media and uh, i'm sure they're you know i'm sure they're retarding that growth and you know i just try to ignore it frankly i just don't i don't want to engage my mind with what the mainstream media tells me because i think anyone who's traveled the world and who's talked to journalists knows that there's a tremendous amount of censorship that goes on and that's why we created this show called buzzsaw with uh, tyrell ventura who's jesse ventura's son he and i do uh do buzzsaw and uh you know we uh try to cover alternative media points that the mainstream media is not doing and we're not you know we're not the only source out there but you know we're getting good good hits you know we do a weekly thing on youtube every you know every every friday saturday we release um you know five or six stories that we think are of interest and uh, an interview or two with uh you know people that we just feel are are doing things that are important that are not being um let, let's say just not getting enough attention from the mainstream mm -hmm. can you give me an example of a couple of issues there that you, that you've gotten really excited about and that you've uh, done some stories about, but it just doesn't seem that it gets out into the mainstream media. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, as far as stories, I mean, we've they every week they do, um, you know, they do interesting stuff. But I've, you know, I've enjoyed do, talking to people about mysticism, for example, Masons talking about like the mystical uh, initiation path of magic, and talking, you know, talk to them about the reptilians and other entities that you know have been reported to exist throughout time and what they're doing, you know, how they interact with humans. We've done, we've done interviews with Jeremy Scahill, for example, about his documentary Dirty Wars. Um, Daniel Ellsberg talking about Bradley Manning and whistleblowers. We've talked to, um, talked to people about the Fukushima radio, uh, uh, radioactivity and the fallout and the continuous fallout from it. Um, we've done a lot of, you know, interesting shows just across the spectrum. Even de we've done a show on, on aliens, on the, the, the uh, Disclosure Project. There was a, um, uh, you know, a hearing, a citizens' hearing in in, con in a in a mock Congress. It's called the citizens' hearing on disclosure about the alien phenomenon the presence here. Um, so we got to do a show on that. Um, we've done a lot of really you know curious stuff that at, you know what I like about it is that it's archived. You know, you go to you go to YouTube and it's there. No matter when people have a chance to, to see it, whether it's now or if it's ten years from now, you know, God willing, it's you know YouTube's still there. Uh, people can go back and, and learn from it. Yeah, that's excellent. I. I... I'm going to, have to check this out here. I haven't had. I mean, I living in Sweden, I was not even aware of this, so I'll check it out. The um, and share it as well. The um, the 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 thing is, do, do you really do you think? I'm just going to throw this out you here. Do you think that there is a uh, what you would call a conspiracy similar to you know X Files? You'd see the the these several people meeting in a. Uh, a dark room and deciding the fate of the world or do you think it's more of a just a mindset amongst people who have positions of power or is it kind of an, uh, something somewhere in between because I mean you can go onto the internet and find lots of stuff about Masons Illuminati um, oh, what's that organization in California um, oh, I forgot uh, the, the organization where they have the big owl and they do the um, the Bohemian Grove and and stuff like that. Do you where 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 do you feel is kind of the logical pinpoint of it? It you know are are we like totally controlled or is a is several different factions that vie for control? Uh, how do you think that works? Hmm. Um. It's interesting. I mean, yeah, uh, I, you know, personally, I think there's different organ, you know, there's different factions, different bloodlines, families, and it's a very old story that probably pertains to what were called aliens or um, entities. Some people call them demons, but I don't think they're just demonic. I don't just say they're all evil. But I do think that they were, um, you know, I, th I do kind of, I do believe the story of the Anunnaki, you know, the ones who came from heaven to earth. 
you know, that we thought that was reported in the Mesopotamia and the Sumerian scriptures. And uh, all, you know, if you look at all, almost all of the creation myths, if not all the creation math, myths, there's always um, gods, you know, multiple gods who, who uh, form humans, create humans. And if that's the case, then you have to imagine that those entities that created humans are still, um, still have an influence or still have a role or a say in what humans are doing. And regard, you know, I don't, you know, I don't pretend to know uh, all, you know, all the different factions because if that, in that case, it's galactic, you know, it's more than, and there's not just one race. There's a lot of entities, and there's many worlds and many realities. So whether or not, you know, the Illuminati all ultimately serve uh, Satan, you know, I don't believe that all illuminated ones are evil. I don't believe that it's only the evil that has power in this world. I think there's plenty of those who are awakened and enlightened to serve, you know, to serve the higher interest of humanity. But I do believe that a lot of these cults, you know, these groups that have formed, um, you know, they do, they do, they do serve uh, their own interests. And uh, unfortunately, you know, the secrecy of it is, uh, is a problem, is problematic because they don't want to share, you know, their knowledge of, especially technology. You know, I think that the biggest crime against humanity is the binding of Prometheus the fact that Prometheus was the god who gave man fire and he was punished for it and I think that's continuous threat that though that those who try to serve humanity by by giving us access to, to for example uh, higher orders of energy production things like fusion power right or even even higher orders of, of, of productivity let's say um, the energy flux density that's produced um, through these processes like, like fusion, um, that's all been stopped. You know, it's consistently been, been checked. So humans are not being given the best possible state to live in. They're not being given the best possible standard of living. They're not give, be, being given access to the knowledge of how to keep themselves healthy, you know, how, how to really treat themselves energetically because the, because the, the occult knowledge of energy is tremendous. You know, uh, they, they, the knowledge of how, you know how we're just energetic bodies in physical form is true and yet you know that's not being conveyed to people it's not being taught to them we're still being taught mecha mechanistically yeah whatever it, okay that's in that that's checking the knowledge from being spread that's checking that that's stopping preventing this knowledge from spreading that's evil to me um and it's not i don't know you know i don't know if it's if it's any if, the, if these cult groups you know are all stopping it or if there is some that actually do have the best interest of men, men involved but they're being stopped by a higher power you know I can't say for sure mm -hmm. but I do because there's unseen things and the unseen things are um, are actually more real than what we see well I, I find it interesting in that if you if you study the dynamics of the elite through history and even today and and so forth you find that it's almost like they have um, – many of these people, if not most, have a hyper-spirituality, whereas at the same time, they are – they discourage any sort of spirituality amongst the masses. I mean it just seems to be the, the, the uh, image I've gotten at least through my studies and things that I've looked in that the uh, – it's almost like wanting to have this power – whatever power it is but concentrated within certain people but then everyone else is supposed to just believe well you're just an accident of some protoplasm and uh you evolved and that's it so i don't know i mean i i, I have found it interesting that a lot of our history in the united states if you look at symbols and monuments and so forth have a very strong esoteric meaning right So, I mean, if you want to share something on that there, I wasn't making it as a statement. It's more of a, you know, a lead in there. I mean, it, it just seems there's a lot of stuff that most people are not even really aware of out there. Sure. I mean, this is very broad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a fun topic, but it is broad. Um, you know, I mean, is there anything more specific you want to ask? Well, essentially, it, it's, it's just that you – 
a person sounds really crazy if they start talking about rituals that people do. I mean, if you mention something like Bohemian Grove and describe it to people, people think that you're making something up you saw in some sort of late night movie. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, Bohemian Grove to me was a tremendous uh, eye opener, and I think anyone should should watch. Everyone should watch the Alex Jones uh, documentary on it, or at least watch the ritual as, it, as it's being performed. You know, it's being staged like a Wagnerian opera. And yet, it, it, there's there's truth to that. I mean, it's very fascinating to 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 see what's being done because a lot of it is, I'm sure you can't really understand unless you're there and feeling it. And the thing is, you know, that's that to me was just like a gateway of of, of, under, of knowledge of saying, okay, there's there's a deeper there's something deeper resonating here. Why are they making a mock sacrifice of a child? You know, even if it's a mock sacrifice, what is that about? What is this ancient ritual? You know that they that they that they that they are uh, conducting even in just um, you know a ritual ceremonial form. What is it? Where does it come from? Why don't we know about this? What do they know that we don't? Yeah, and I that's mean, just you want to inquire more. Yeah, and if you look at a lot of symbols and things like that, if you if you have knowledge of if you study Mesopotamian Egyptian um, history and religion and symbolism. You find the stuff popping up all over. Now, it could just be a something from the Enlightenment, but at the same time, it just seems somewhat coincidental that you have all of these different um, esoteric symbols just, you know, out there. Some of them have been confused. Obviously, like if you look at the pentagram, that's confused with Satanism, even though if you look at its ancient symbolism, doesn't it have something to do with Solomon? Or, I mean, it even goes before Solomon and and so forth. Yeah, yeah, and again, you know, this is why the mystery schools were so important. You know, it was it was very important to maintain this lineage, to maintain this understanding, and every society has it. You know, every society has its shamanic um, institutions. You know, they have their the Sufis in Islam, they have um, the Templar Knights in Christianity, or, you know, the Masons, um, the Kabbalah and Judaism. There's always these esoteric knowledges, and I just feel like you have to kind of seek it out for your for yourself to begin to walk that path and everyone has to, everyone has to, to find it for themselves mm -hmm. because it's your initiation into knowledge into your higher your higher understanding yeah and um, could you share some of your insights you had when you 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 met with some people that were experts on this when you were in Iran didn't you on what on the jinns yeah yeah I talk I you know I, I try to keep in touch with people who know about the jinns the jinns are fascinating to me because in Iran um, you know, in Iran, in not just Iran, in all the Muslim world, you know, people, when you talk about aliens, you talk about entities, demons, uh, ghosts, it, it's not like you're talking like a crazy person, you know, it, here in the West, we've become so clinical and, um, uh, as we've become presumptuous in knowing the origins of, uh, of, of phenomenon that we, we, we credit all of it to uh, neurological, um, disorders and you know psychiatric um, uh, understandings and yet if you look across the world there's you know there's there's this you know what you would call superstition but fundamentally like an understanding that there's entities there's something that's that's creating um, that's or at least co-creating these phenomenon with you and we you know you oftentimes we go into altered states in order to see it and yet that doesn't mean that it's not real because as we know we our eyes see less than one percent of reality our eyes physically cannot see reality. We are not designed to see it. We are designed to see a limited spectrum. We know that even dogs have different senses, even bats, right? Animals have different uh, uh, eyesights than we do, right? They see different spectrums. So we know that our eyes are just instruments, our ears are just instruments, and we are confusing our instrumentation for a definitive understanding of, 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 of the reality. So when you go to these Muslim countries, and it's, I was fascinated by the fact that they talk about the jinns and they say well look in the quran we know jinns exist the jinns are created by god they're genies we call them genies here but they are um, as real as we are we just can't see them and they have influence and, and they uh, they have societies and satan is supposed to be actually the head of the jinns there's jinns who worship satan there's jinns who worship or worship god right who are they're positive and negative jinns and the negative ones they believe have influence over people the same way they you know david Icke talks about reptilians that, you know, some people are reptilians in human form. The Muslims say the same thing. They're humans. They're jinns in human form. Right? So then again, you think back about the aliens, the idea of the aliens that came to Earth that created humans 
and some of their descendants became the kings and like the you know the bloodlines. Um, so now, what if those humans that you know that look how do you say that that have that have certain power influence, maybe they're maybe they're closer to the bloodlines of the rulers of, of the of the alien entities, the jinns, right? So no one knows definitively, but it's just interesting that when you discuss the Illuminati and the idea of, of um, people doing deals with jinns or you know conjuring them through magical rituals, all of that makes sense to anyone who knows about the jinns. But in the American psyche, because we've been cut off from the rituals, we've been cut off from knowledge about the occult, it's something that's uh, that that just sounds crazy. Well, it's like what I just I, I mentioned a second ago. The the thing is, a lot of the symbols that we associate with the occult that Hollywood always shows as being occultish, if you look at their true origins, they actually they they go back to um, ancient Hebrew and and even further than that, Egyptian and Mesopotamian and so forth. For instance. Um, the whole idea of the um, the six-sided star, the hexagram, and the five-point star, the pentagram, um, those those were very integral in um, Solomon, Con Solomon's era, wasn't it? Conjuring of jinns, yes. Solomon wore the ring of power, which was the five-sided ring, five five-pointed star. Some people said six, but I uh, I think it was initially five, and that's how he uh, controlled the jinns. Now. Eh. It's a long story, but <laughs> the point the point is that uh, that yes, it, it's always been the five sided star has always been you is been connected to the idea of opening doorways or portals into other dimensions and interacting with those entities, and that's why they were associated by by the Catholic Church with Satanism because Satan because the Catholic Church would not allow anyone that power aside from the Church itself. You see, I'm sure inside the, church, the Catholic Church, all the reports, I'm sure those rumors and reports are true about um, Satanism, black magic, magic being practiced inside the, the Catholic Church or underground um, within certain sects or cults within the Catholic Church because they, because it's real. And if magic is real, then why, and if you're in a position of power, why wouldn't you want to practice it or at least be aware of it or at least guard against it, right? Mm -hmm. The Catholic Church basically, you know, uh, rooted out any all those who challenged their authority, even the Knights Templar. Uh, because the Templar Knights obviously understood it, and um, I'm not gonna—I don't know exactly, you know, all the reasons why the, the Catholic Church decided to to kill off the Templars. But the point is that they were they were a potential rival to the Catholic Church's power, and uh, anyone who knows magic is a, is a threat to that power. So when they kill off uh, witches, you know, the point is that anyone who was an herbologist who understood the nature of uh, plants and how plants plants and, and toxic. <laughs> I say toxicology is, is, is important in, the, in attaining these altered states to understand the reality, to, under, to see the things that are unseen by the eyes. They were, anyone who knew this, this science was called a, a witch or a sorcerer, right? Mm -hmm. And they were out and killed too. Because no one is allowed to know that reality is not what we're seeing. It's not what we're being shown. We have to search it out for ourselves. We have to learn to see that there are other dimensions that are affecting us at all times. We live in interdimensional reality. Mm -hmm. And that's just it, it, it is true, and anyone who's ever experienced, and you know, everyone, everyone at some point in their life experiences a paranormal or supernatural phenomenon because they are at some point glimpsing that other side. As Jim Morrison put it, who was fascinated by shamans, he said, "Break on through to the, to the other side." He was saying specifically what he had experienced, and yet through his music, he was helping people to awaken to it. But the thing is, you know, it's not easy because if you don't go through the, pro the proper procedure when initiating yourself to the other side, you can get attacked by demons. You can fall under the spell of demons. You can become a uh, satanic in, 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 in believing that you have power when you don't. You know, you may think you have power over these entities and yet they're playing you. They will turn on you and, and destroy you. So it's a very dangerous process. The same way drugs are very dangerous. I don't think that everyone should just go use drugs. Drugs are for initiation. If you don't have shamans, teachers, people who understand that world, Helping to administer it, you're going to end up getting lost in a very in a very dangerous dark place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think that? Um, Terror world, but not in, in what was taught to us in you know in uh, rudimentary public school. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know the the thing is, um, 
I, I really like the way this is uh, the direction we've taken here because I really I'm really interested in this esoteric uh, information. Do you believe? I mean, if, if you if you look at all the headlines, it it seems in many ways bleak. Uh, you know, it seems that economic strength is decreasing in the West. Uh, you have the millennial generation, the people that were born during the 80s are having a really tough time. I mean, so I, a third of them are still living at home even. Yeah. I mean, I'm one of them. Yeah. Well, the thing is that it's almost like we're, you know, World War One. there were so many casualties. It was called the lost generation because so many, you know, it, it seriously affected the birth rate, and, you know, after the war and so forth because there just weren't a lot of men to go around in some countries. And now it seems that there's a lot of problems with the economy to where people are not getting married. They're not having children. And, you know, you have these other uh, situations coming along uh, that seem bleak with like, you know, the spy grid and the surveillance state. Now, here's an interesting question for you. Do you think that we might be heading for some sort of uh, counterculture uh, reemergence like we had during the 1960s in which people will lose their faith in, well, if they haven't lost it already, I'm not, I'm not sure how they keep it. They lose their faith in government and traditional social institutions and try to forge a new path and of course along with that could be these esoteric ways of thinking i hope so i think it's there i think all the ingredients are there because now people know so much more about it you see i mean i i got into i got interested by the occult and the illuminati and the idea of esoteric knowledge when i was 15 16 years old and or even 17 let's say and that was uh, 2001, right? So when I sought this out, I was looking in odd books in odd bookstores. You know, those the same places that people in the 1970s were looking, basically in these bookstores, right? These old weird, old, you know, uh, hangouts for like witches, right? In, Gre in Greenwich Village and places like this. And I was in Los Angeles. So the point was, it was a very uh, small niche location. People talked about health food, you know, health foods and organic eating and um, you know, ayahuasca. And 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 uh, you know yoga. This was all still more kitsch, and yet now you 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 think you know, 13, 12, 13 years later. Twelve, thirteen years later, um, people have the internet. YouTube is is broadcasting videos that you used to have to order. You know to find you know you'd have someone send to you or you'd talk to some friend who knew about you know. Oh, John, Jordan Maxwell's got this video. Oh, cool. You know, now you just plug in, you know, Illuminati. Oh, Jordan Maxwell, you know, millions of views. We're out there. We know, like, the, the, the community is so much more accessible to people to tap into. Yoga has become a, a, a fad. Uh, diet, you know, healthy eating is, is a fad. The, these things are becoming more, it's, it's entered human consciousness in a way that you can no longer rescind it. You cannot deny it. Now the question is, where do we go from here? And it's always those ideas that initially seem, um, they initially seem taboo or they initially seem, you know, how do you say, uh, pre, almost premature or avant-garde that will in 20 years become the accepted thinking. So that's why. You know, that's really where the interesting evolution is going to be. It's like, forget the 1960s, 70s counterculture. Can the next counterculture become mainstream? Can these kids growing up, like myself, you know, under 30, growing up with the Internet, growing up with this access to information, knowledge, how can, how can the conspiracy maintain itself for another 30, 40 years if we keep this level of information going and access to information and knowledge circulating and cycling? You know, I feel like the corruption shows itself more quickly. The realization of conspiracy has become much more prevalent. You know, in the in the '90s, conspiracy theorists were were, were ridiculed on you know, and, and and people were terrified of being called a conspiracy theorist. Now, conspiracy theory is is a very it's too popular a word to simply feel like it's 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 a ridicule. Now it's just oh, just a way of it's just a way of thinking. And guess what? The next the next incarnation is going to be, yeah, conspiracies are real. Let's deal with it. Let's find out. You know, let's let's really let's deal with reality now. I'm curious to see is where we take it to the next evolution. Yeah, because it just seems to me that the 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 human spirit, unless you distract it with, you know, drugs and uh, 
bear, you know, reality TV and stuff like that, the human spirit wants to grow. And with the internet, with the with the access to new ways of thinking, it seems, especially the millennials and the kids today, are being exposed to, like you said, ideas that before you had to you had to live in the right urban area where you had access to certain places that you could go to to find information now now it's accessible you just click it on right exactly it's it's there it's so much closer than ever before and so much more intimate that it's really just a question of time before it becomes the mainstream mm -hmm. i think it is it's becoming more and more in the mainstream today we have two minutes left and what i'd like you to do is Plug some of the stuff you're doing and let people know how they can find more information out about your activities and, and things that you would like to share with people. Wait, wait, what, what I'd like to share in a sense. Well, you know, where, where they can go and find more information and basically uh, if, they, if they've not heard about a lot of the stuff you've talked about, where they can go and learn more. <laughs> Ah, uh, man, there's so many places. It's just, it's, you know, I, I would just simply say, you know, you can, uh, you can, you, get, you should check, it, check, check out our show, Buzzsaw, uh, which is available on YouTube. Uh, we do weekly shows that, you know, it's a good kind of intro point, let's say, to some alternative stuff. There's Conspiracy Theory with Jesse Ventura. We've done, some, we did some great episodes on that show. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of people like Jordan Maxwell and um, the, the progenerators of, this thinking into the occult and, and trying to analyze it. I think he's one of the best deciphers or decoders of the reality that you can find out there. Um, and other than that, you know, just keep yourself open and, and, and constantly inquiring because what's, tr what, what, you know, what's, what's powerful and important for me is not the same for everybody. You know, my journey is my journey. I can't tell, I can't tell you, you know, the, whether or not you need to take an hallucinogen to you know, to see things, you know, and or if you should find you know religion or, or find God, because at the end of the day, that's that's your journey. You know, for me, meditation is a great practice every day. But for you, you know, maybe you just do yoga, or maybe you just go walk outside in nature and you open up. Everyone has their own path; they have to find it. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. I mean, I mean, I think if people do that and just kind of you know follow that advice and kind of try to break away from the matrix, they'll be a lot happier. Okay, well. Again, thank you so much, Sean, for sharing all this really, really fascinating information. And I really encourage people to check out Buzzsaw and some of the other works that you've done. Um, well, I'm just have a great week. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on, Michael. Okay. Appreciate it. Okay. Take care. All right. Talk to you soon.